Well, hello again, and thank you to everybody for um, letting me know that you're receiving the live stream all clear, and uh, you know, I'm so grateful for you letting me know and sending through your text messages. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you um, sometimes tune into other churches' services, not that you would do that, <laughs> and you know, they have a live chat often going. Um, I've got a live chat going on my phone, so hello everybody that said hello. Um, I won't go by name just this time. I might next time though. But thanks again for joining with us and I hope you enjoyed um, our time of worship. Sarah Fox and the team are, are taking this week off. They'll be back with, a, with um, live worship um, hopefully next week and um, so be praying for that. Our team is quite small at the moment but you know what? It doesn't matter because God receives our worship. It doesn't matter what the external is. It's all from our heart and that's what God receives from you today. So well done everybody. Um, so here we are. Um, we're already in week three of our series on soulology. And so far, we've talked about really what makes a person a person. And my personal view is that we're made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. And what I want to do today is show you the relationship between all of those components, the different parts of who you are, and how they integrate and how they relate to each other. But before we go on, let's remind ourselves of our definition from week one about the soul. The soul is the immaterial part of a person that relates to God, yet works to integrate all our components, our body, our mind, will, and spirit, into the one being. And to give you a real quick example of how this kind of plays out, I'll share this with you. If you've ever had children, you will certainly know what I'm about to talk about. And even if you haven't had kids, I'm sure you will have seen what I'm about to describe to you. Often, little children around the age of two demonstrate to us how all these parts work together. Their will, their mind, their emotions, uh, and their bodies all coming together. And you will see this sometimes play out, often in public uh, down supermarket shopping aisles or shopping centres. And you'll see their mothers often demonstrating their own will and through their bodies by walking down a separate aisle away from their screaming child. But, you know, it's not just kids, is it? Perhaps this morning your will is saying, I really want to stay awake for this message. But your body is saying something different. Your body is saying, I really want to go to sleep. And maybe some of you are. So if somebody is with you and they're going to just give them a bit of a nudge and wake them up. Tell them you don't want to miss what we have for you today. But here's the thing. In order to be like Jesus, my will must be surrendered. My mind must be transformed. My body submitted and my soul saved. But there's a huge problem to this definition, and it gets in the way of all of being like Jesus. And it's a condition that the Bible speaks quite a lot about, and often churches shy away from a little. This is the condition of sin. You see, sin enslaves my will, distorts my mind, and sin corrupts the body and can ultimately damn the soul. So I want to show you today how sin can affect your soul, but also how God equips the soul to withstand the power of sin. And I want to start by showing you um, a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we read a description on the condition of people in the last days. Have a listen to this list in which the Apostle Paul wrote a long time ago to a young pastor named Timothy, where he said this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. They will be brutal, not lovers of, of the good treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. You know, we spoke last week about the difference between the self and the soul. 
Now, if I had to come up with a list of attributes for people who are only looking out for themselves, well, it comes pretty close, doesn't it? Or to put it better, if we had to list the attributes of an unhealthy soul, I think this list would just about sum it up. And what the Apostle Paul is describing is a condition. Listen to the words he uses. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, ungrateful, unforgiving, conceited, slanderous, without any self-control. And the thought kind of struck me when I was reading this list. You know, this isn't the beginning. This is the end times. These are the last days. This isn't how God created us. This wasn't the starting point. In the beginning, we read in Genesis how we were made by God, for God, to be with God forever. But we also know that when sin entered humanity, it disconnected us from God. And here is a list of what it looks like as a consequence, being disconnected from God, where sin enters and disintegrates the soul. But as I reflected on this list, I thought to myself, you know, there had to be a time, you know, when all of these things actually got started. You see, people who are unforgiving, it had to have started somewhere. People just aren't born unforgiving. It starts somewhere. and Perhaps it started out because they were deeply hurt. The ungrateful didn't start out ungrateful. You know, perhaps they were treated in a way which, you know, fed their entitlement. Abusive people were perhaps conditioned by the way that they were treated and began to turn it towards others so that they could finally feel powerful and in control. My point is this, the disintegration of the soul, it's a slow fade. It's a slow fade, but it starts when the soul is left disconnected from God when it's no longer connected to him. And this opens us up to sin, but sometimes that disconnection is caused by sin. And it's very, very serious. And this is why the Bible says to take care and to keep your soul diligently. You remember the video that I showed um, at the end of week one's message, the keeper of the stream? Your life and mine is dependent on the welfare of our soul. And its deterioration or its disintegration happens when we don't keep it well. Dallas Willard talks about this in his book, Renovations of the Heart. And he says that if your soul is healthy, no external circumstances can destroy your life. But if your soul is unhealthy, no amount of external circumstances can redeem it. So God knew that the soul left untethered and untended would lead to disintegration. And so God does something wonderful. He doesn't leave it entirely to ourselves. He equips us. The other day, I asked my youngest boy, Will, to clean up his room. And, you know, um, and I knew it was a big job. And so um, I didn't want to let him and leave him all on his own to do it. So I decided to encourage him and equip him. And uh, so... I asked him, would you like me to bring the vacuum cleaner upstairs to help you? And he said, yes, please. I went downstairs, grabbed the vacuum cleaner, brought it upstairs and, and kind of left it with him. And, and um, I came back a little while later to check on him. And um, to my surprise, the vacuum cleaner was still in the same spot. And he's, he's on his hands and knees going along the skirting boards, just picking up little bits of paper and bits of rubbish that had been left there. I said, mate, why don't you use the vacuum cleaner? And he said, I, I don't know how. I said, well, mate, it's easy. You just like plug it in and turn it on. <laughs> and, um, and I showed him and he let me demonstrate. <laughs> and then he later went, went and told mum, you know, that um, we did the room together. <laughs> but here's, here's the thing. Will's room is his responsibility. But as his father, you know, I love him and want to help and equip him. In the same way, your soul is your responsibility, but you have a heavenly father who loves you and wants to equip you to take care of it. God doesn't leave you to yourself to look after your soul. And that is why I believe that we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. 
And so this is why I use the concentric circles to kind of uh, show us how all of this kind of works. You see, the soul is a spiritual word and therefore it needs a spiritual connection. And God gives to each person access to something with great power, the Holy Spirit. And it has the power to transform your soul. Scripture tells us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and living inside of each of us, each believer. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And you receive the Holy Spirit in, um, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. We need the Spirit. The soul needs the Spirit. When we become a Christian, God sends the Holy Spirit inside of us and He is the Holy Spirit and He is God. He is a person and He is able to live inside us supernaturally. And while I don't want to turn this sermon into a Holy Spirit sermon because, you know, it will take time, um, it's important that you know what the Holy Spirit's role is in your life and how it works through your soul. So broadly speaking, here's a little about what the Holy Spirit does. First of all, He keeps you connected to God. He provides supernatural enablement and power. He guides you into understanding the truth of God and, and God's Word through His Word. He convicts us of sin and leads us to repentance. He produces fruit in our life as evidence of the work that He's doing through us. He imparts supernatural gifts in order to fulfill God's purposes and plan. Spiritual gifts. He comforts us and brings to us healing and restoration. Why does he do all of this? Well, when the Holy Spirit lives in you, he goes on a mission to make you holy, to make you like Jesus. And so um, you will be effective on earth and you'll also um, be prepared for eternity in heaven. But here's the kicker. The Holy Spirit works through your soul. There is a relationship between the body, soul, and spirit. And if you don't understand this relationship and, and how it works, then you kind of set yourself up for confusion later on, frustration, and the potential for unbelief. You see, time and time again, I see Christians who start out with great passion, but then, you know, they do great, try and do great things for God in their own strength, just within their own body. And then they don't feed their soul. They don't nourish it. They don't understand the relationship of the Spirit. And they kind of just fizz out. And then they question why they're not effective. Then they doubt God is real. And then they eventually walk away from their faith because what's the point? So let's talk about this relationship. Firstly, Scripture affirms the relationship, these three components of body, soul, and spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, there are those three components, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? So, so far we've spoken a lot about, um, in this series, um, about the soul and the body. And I want to just finish today's message talking to you a little bit about the relationship with the Holy Spirit. When we become a Christian, we receive the Holy Spirit. And we are instantaneously a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We are now clothed, cloaked in the righteousness of Jesus, born again. And so we receive the Spirit, and the Spirit then has to work its way out through our soul and, and out through our body. And this is a process known as sanctification. It's the ongoing making of us more like Jesus, and that takes a bit of time. In fact, it'll take a time. And this is the process by which the Spirit works to conform us into the image of Christ. How the Spirit does that is through the soul. The Spirit of God flows through the soul, our mind and our will, outward to the body, what we do and what we say. But, you know, it's, it's not natural. It's not a natural thing. It's sometimes very difficult for us to understand, but it's not natural for the Holy Spirit to work through us. 
But how much you open yourself to the Holy Spirit will be proportionate to the Spirit's ability to work through you. And I want to talk to you about that. You might remember when Jesus was walking through his hometown of Nazareth. Um, the gospel writers tell us that Jesus couldn't do any mighty works there. Why not? He's Jesus. The gospel writers tell us because they weren't open because of their unbelief, implying that if they hadn't been open, then Jesus could have, but they weren't. I recently got a new barbecue, and um, so naturally I was very, very excited to, to get it all happening and working. Um, it needed a little bit of assembly, but you know, once it was all together, all the parts put together, I gave it a good clean and, and made it look really amazing. And, and I went and chopped some onions because, you know, you've got to have onions right on a barbecue. And so I, I was in preparing um, some food to barbecue, and I just had to keep looking at it, admiring it, going, wow, it's a great looking barbecue. And it's mine. I was so happy. But you know, a barbecue can look great, and a barbecue um, can be cleaned well and, and made to look fantastic and have heaps and heaps of potential. But until you connect it to gas, well, it's not much use. But then you've got to control how much gas you allow into it. And there's a little valve on the gas bottle that allows that uh, on the gas cylinder. And then there's two knobs on the, uh, the barbecue that can control the amount of flow of gas from the bottle to the burners. And if you want more gas to bring more heat to the barbecue then you need to control the valves. And what you have to understand here at this point is your soul is like a reservoir that needs to be filled. But, um, but your soul is also like a valve itself. And what you let flow through your soul will be produced and outworked into and through the body. You know, you can open the valve to many things, because your soul just wants to be filled. It has a deep reservoir and it wants to be filled. And you can open that valve and fill your soul with many things. Many people fill it with the, the, the worldly stuff and, and culture stuff and, and, and open their soul to sin. You can, you, can open your, you can open that valve to the world or you can open it to the spirit. And this is where we get the idea of being controlled in you know, the battle of the flesh and the spirit. You know, um, what God wants for you is for you to open that valve, open yourself up more to Him. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come and, and take over. You have to open yourself up to Him. You have to give Him permission. You have to open that valve to Him. But there's a problem to all of this. And every single one of us has this going on inside of us, it's the old nature versus the new nature. It's the battle of the flesh and the spirit. You know, there's a poem that goes, two natures beat inside my chest. One is foul and one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, but the one I feed will dominate. And one of the ways in which you can tell you're a Christian and that you have the Holy Spirit is you always be conflicted. It's one of the surest ways to know that you're filled with the Spirit is that the, the Spirit will be convicting you of sin and, and showing you ways to, 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 to move away from that and move toward God. The Spirit will be active in your life. And of course, the more you um, press into God, the, the more you will see victory in your life. And it doesn't mean you always win, but you know, the longer you walk with Jesus and the, longer, and the more you open yourself up to His Spirit working in your life, the, you will find that you will have more victories and defeats. The more you open that valve or that door or whatever you want to call the metaphor, whatever, whenever you open your soul up to God and His Spirit, the more God will come inside and work through you. The more you allow the world or the flesh or sin to flow through you, well then the more disconnected you get from God and the more connected you get to the world. And then what your life is, what your life produces is directly related to what you're feeding it or to what you're filling your soul with. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. But this is why um, in First Peter, Peter tells us, Dear friends, 
I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. These are two natures that are, that are going at war within your soul. And your soul is, again, it's like a reservoir that needs to be filled. But your soul also needs to be satisfied. And you can fill it with so many things, but it'll only ever be satisfied when it is filled with the Spirit. That's why Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, For it's not to be drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit. People try to fill their lives with many things to find satisfaction in their life. People try to fill their life with uh, many things to find freedom from pain. Or many people will turn to external things such as alcohol or drugs. And some will turn to uh, relationships, sometimes unhealthy relationships. And then there are the, even the tamer things in life that people will turn to to try and find fulfillment and satisfaction. Things like um, social media or perhaps their work. Maybe even their children. Perhaps even ministry to try and find that satisfaction and fulfillment. But it won't. It will never. Because your soul was created to be filled with God by His Spirit. You as a person are a body, a soul, and spirit. And they're all meant to come together and work together. St. Augustine, the early church father from the 4th century, who wrote it beautifully when he penned these words. You have made us for yourself, O Lord. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. How does this happen? How do we open that valve to allow more of the Spirit into my life? Well, I said at the start, my will must be surrendered, my mind must be transformed, my body submitted, and ultimately my soul saved. Your soul needs to be filled and your soul needs to be satisfied. And if you don't fill your soul with God, then your soul will want to be filled. It will want to be filled with other things. But you get to choose. If it's filled with other things, you won't be satisfied. In fact, many people fill their lives with lots of stuff and they just feel more and more empty. You remember the first list I gave you? Uh, that list is a list um, of people who have given into their flesh. Um, they've associated too much with the world, perhaps. But listen to the fruit that is produced in a person's life when they open that valve and allow more of the Spirit to flow through their soul. In Galatians chapter 5, 22, 23, Paul tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a much better list, isn't it? Folks, I know that many of you are just trying to do your best right now. You were trying to make sense of these times and your situation. But let me finish today with ways in which you can feed and nourish your soul. Ways in which you can allow more of the Spirit in your life. So let me ask you this. And by, way, by the way, there's no, there's no judgment here. We're all in the same boat. But what are you filling your soul with this season? Is your will submitted to your Lord? Or are you kind of still calling the shots? Are you asking what the Lord's will is with the decisions that you're making? Are you, you're making? Or are you determining your decisions based on perhaps what will bring you um, more comfort and less pain or more happiness and less difficulty? Or are you surrendering, surrendering your will to God's will? Even though it might look unfamiliar or difficulty, or, di or filled with difficulty or paved with uncertainty. You know, sometimes these are the very places that God uses to build us, to transform us, to grow us in our faith and trust in Him. What are you filling your mind with? You know, um, 
Is your will submitted to God? But what are you filling your mind with? Is it being conformed and shaped to the world? Or is it being transformed into the mind and likeness of Christ? Where do your thoughts take you down? You know, do they take you down a path of life? Or do they take you down a path that is filled with despair? Is your mind producing feelings that are based in fear? Or is your mind steadfast and solid, resting on a God who is bigger than you and your circumstances? Or are you just reading inspirational quotes that that feed your soul for five minutes, but not allowing the Word of God to to take root in your life. The Word of God, as Sarah said earlier, is living and active. And Jesus says, you know, this world will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's Word will never pass away. And what about your body? Is your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, fully submitted to Him, to God? Are you using your body in a way which God has intended and ordained? Are you you giving and submitting your body to Him? Or are you giving your body over to lust of the flesh and um, sins of the flesh, lust and pornography, maybe to gluttony or excess? Uh, Or are you exercising and resting and sleeping and keeping a Sabbath which God ordained to submit your body, to stop working, to rest in Him? Are you surrounding yourself with other bodies? You know, um, other people that can love and support you and you them. And what about your connection to the body, God's church? We're told not to forsake the meeting together. It's hard when we can't gather in person, but we can still gather online. You have a soul. And it is so, so important to God that he gives you his spirit to reside inside you and to fill you and to satisfy you. To bring you the ultimate satisfaction in him. You know, perhaps you're listening today and you're not yet a Christian and what I'm saying is making sense and and you know that you need what only God can provide. You're listening to these words and, and, and you feel exactly what I'm describing. You know, you can't receive it until you receive Jesus. I wonder if you would receive Jesus today as your Savior, because when you believe in and accept Jesus as your Savior and His work on the cross to to take your sins and pay the penalty for your sins, you receive salvation, but you also receive the Spirit that is meant to work in your life and bring you and keep you connected to God. I wonder if you would receive Jesus today. Maybe up until this point, you know, you've opened your life up to many different things and they just leave you empty. And perhaps you've tried to do life your own way, but you know that there is more to life. But you've never made the step to accept Jesus. I wonder whether you would do that today. I'd love to pray for you in a moment and make that happen today. Maybe you are a Christian, but you know, today, you know that you're filling your soul with stuff and other stuff, and you know it's not healthy for your soul. And you know that it won't nourish it. And you know that, in fact, it is leaving you empty. And maybe you need to close that valve off to some of those things and open it to more of the Spirit. You know, there's no condemnation here. But I know the Spirit will be whispering to some of you today. So I'd love to pray for you as well. You know, this is the most loving thing that I can do for you during this moment. So let's pray together. Would you allow me to pray for you? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, And maybe you might even want to posture your hands open to receiving from God today. He loves you. He is for you. He is with you. And he's calling you to himself today. Would you receive him? Let's pray. Father, I want to pray first of all for anyone today who feels empty 
and needing more of your spirit today. Maybe today you need to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. You've never really done that. You've never really made that decision. But you know that you need to. And it's really simple. Would you pray this prayer after me? Jesus, I accept that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross for my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Take my life and make me new. Thank you in Jesus' name. And maybe for you, Christian, today, I'd love to pray for you. You know, Jesus loves you. He has nothing but love and goodness for you and directed to you today. I'd love to pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall upon every person in a fresh way today. I pray that as they turn their hearts to you, open themselves up to you, that you would come and flood their soul, flood their life. Refresh them. Energize them and enable them to know that you are with them, that they are loved, deeply loved by God today. I pray, God, that you would help us to put down those things that are not healthy and to to take hold of the good that you have for us through your Spirit today. Flow through us. We want more of you. We receive you today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, if you've prayed that prayer, would you get in contact with us? I'd love to be able to hear your story. I'd love to be able to pray with you more and and help support you in that decision. Send me an email so I can chat with you more about this decision. And if you're finding it hard today to break free from some of those things that are coming against your soul, reach out. Let somebody know who's a Christian. You can contact us. I'd love to be able to meet with you, pray with you, and support you as well. Maybe there's somebody else that you can reach out to. But don't do this alone. You weren't meant to do it alone. God loves you. He wants to free you, and He can do it if you would only release, put down those things, and and receive Him today. Please send us an email. We'd love to chat with you and, and support you. Thanks for tuning in with us today. I hope that today's service has blessed you and encouraged you. And I hope you found it helpful. And above everything else, I just want you to know that God loves you. And I really pray that you would know that nothing can ever separate you from God's love. Nothing will ever separate you from God's love. We'd love to support you here at Lifeway. We'd love to help you know more about God and His love for you. We'd love to be able to support you. So please, never hesitate to get in contact with us. If if maybe there's other things that you're going through today, reach out. We'd love to provide prayer and support for you as well. You're never a burden to us. This is a joy for us to be able to love and support and care for you. So until we have the chance to see each other again, hopefully in person, but maybe online, stay safe, everybody. God bless and see you soon.